writing club. I'm not, not used to the Holy Spirit of Mike here, so. <laughs> uh, but no, we are indeed fortunate uh, that uh, they have, again, agreed to uh, donate their time uh, to tell you their story. Because you know, this is a story about real people. This is a story that I think will resonate with you because you're all here because you want to help. Real people. And I know that when you're struggling with odd scores and pathways and everything else that you're going to learn, it's easy to forget why you came here. So I think today's presentation will remind you of that. So for the next about 20 minutes, I'll give you a little background about Miller syndrome, about the sequencing study, and at that point we'll uh, turn the mic over to Debbie, Heather, and Logan. So Miller syndrome. Uh, is known clinically as postaxial atrophial dysostosis. Uh, kind of jawbreaker term. But dysostosis refers to uh, a bone malformation. Acrofacial refers to the locations of the malformation, primarily in the face. And acro is distal, so uh, affecting especially the distal appendages. And then it is primarily uh, postaxial in location. So behind the axis, bones like the ulna and the fibula in particular uh, are affected. So there are uh, craniofacial malformations, uh, limb malformations, including hypoplasia. Hypoplasia means under growth, uh, the radius of ulna, uh, missing digits, conductor hearing loss, cleft palate. Uh, and a few other things that we'll, we'll mention as we go along. Now, as of 1977, when Miller was born, there were only a few cases of Miller syndrome that had ever been described uh, in the literature. No recurrence had been seen in the family, but there were only a few cases. So we were talking oh to Heather and Logan's parents, and they asked the obvious question, what's the likelihood that this will happen again? What would your answer be? What would you tell them? Someone raise their hand. Give me an answer. I would have said we don't really know. That is perfect. People don't usually get it. The right answer is that we don't know. Because there are so few cases, we don't know the public inheritance. We don't even really know at this point in 1977 if it's genetic. So the right answer is not zero, the right answer is not uh, population prevalence. It's simply, we don't know. And it's OK to say we don't know when we really don't. As you will learn from Debbie, that's not the answer they heard back in 1977. So here's a picture of Heather. Uh, back in 1979, she was written up in the Journal of Pediatrics uh, by Marvin Miller, after whom his syndrome is named. Uh, and you can see some craniofacial malformations here. Uh, also, missing digits. You look at her uh, x-ray film. There you can see uh, missing phalanges and metacarpal bones. Uh, also, hypoplasia of the radius and the In 1981, uh, Heather's brother, Logan, was born. And this was the first known recurrence of Miller syndrome in a family. Uh, so this, again, was written up in the Journal of Pediatrics. <coughs> And of course, this sparked our interest in this as potentially a genetic condition. And this is actually when I first learned about Heather and Logan. Uh, I used to go to a genetics clinic uh, every Tuesday. Uh, I got to interact with people like Dr. John Carey, Andrew's dad, uh, and other fine clinicians so that I could learn more about clinical genetics. Uh, and I remembered our conversations about Heather and Logan because this was a real puzzle. And we didn't have the kinds of tools at that time that would allow us to figure out what genetic difference might they have that causes this disease. So this was a mystery. Uh, here's Heather. Uh, a little later, she was splinted prior to one of her corrective surgeries. Uh, Heather and Logan, between the two of them, have had more than 50 major surgeries uh, in their lives. Uh, this is Heather a little bit later. Uh, she's playing here with, I think, Play-Doh? Yep. Yeah. Uh, here's Logan uh, as an infant. Uh, you can see uh, his phenotype, really very, very similar to that of his sister. <clears throat> here's Heather at her high school graduation. Uh, Heather's also a college graduate, a proud graduate of the University of Utah. <laughs> 
green psychology. Uh, so this was at her high school graduation, <laughs> shortly after she had corrective jaw surgery. And you can see there was quite a difference uh, in appearance. This is Bridget, a uh, little girl with Miller syndrome. And you can see the similarities in creating facial features, the limb features in Bridget uh, and Miller and Logan. Uh, this is Logan uh, with Bridget a little later. She's had some con corrective surgery on her lower eyelids. And then these uh, two siblings are named Sherman and Erica. They are the other recurrence of Miller syndrome that we know of in the human family. They're from New Zealand. They're shown here with their unaffected older si sibling, older sister. And again, you can see very, very similar phenotype. This is what allows a clinician really to posit the diagnosis of Miller syndrome. So if we look at the family history and as geneticists, we all want to take a family history. Uh, so here are Heather and Logan, shown as affected with Miller syndrome. Now, interestingly, uh, they also have had bronchiectasis all of their lives. Widening of the air, major airways, um, the hardening of tissue, uh, repeated bronchial pulmonary infections. Uh, and that is not really part of Miller syndrome, per se. So we were very interested in the family history. This is their first cousin, Brandon, who had cystic fibrosis. Of course, CF is a common cause of bronchiectasis. About a third of bronchiectasis in the US is due to CF. Uh, he died at age 31, just a few years ago. So one of our interests, one of our thoughts, was, well, maybe Heather and Logan have a form of cystic fibrosis. They've got bronchiectasis. They have a family history. Uh, and now that you all know how to um, um, estimate things like the coefficient of relationship, how much of our DNA we share with our relatives, let's look at this family. What's, first of all, what's the probability uh, that Debbie's sister here would be a carrier for CF? Yeah, 100%. She is an obligate carrier. Therefore, what is Debbie's probability of being a carrier for CF-causing mutation? Yeah, 50%. A lot of you said 50%. That's exactly right. Because one of the parents here must be a carrier. So uh, that's a 50% chance of transmitting that onto uh, their offspring. So we, about 15 years ago, collected DNA from family members. We sent their DNA off to my colleague, Gary Cutting, uh, who's at Hopkins, an expert on cystic fibrosis. Uh, we genotyped everyone, and indeed, Debbie is a carrier for the most common CF-causing mutation, deletion, uh, at position 508, and both children are carriers of the deletion of it at 508. But dad's chromosome 7 was perfectly normal. Also, their sweat chlorides are in the normal range. So no diagnosis of cystic fibrosis. And in 2009, uh, just nine years ago, eight years ago, we still didn't know the genetic basis of Miller syndrome. We didn't even know for sure if it was genetic based on the information we had at that time. Well, that was about the time it became feasible to sequence whole genomes. And I was working with a company, uh, a group in Seattle uh, that was doing whole genome sequencing. They wanted to sequence a family. Uh, they asked me if I knew a good family that we might sequence, and I said, Actually, I do. It's Miller syndrome back. So you remember, we talked about the cause of, of the cost of sequencing the first genome. That was about $3 billion a dollar a base. Now, I'll just mention for background, a study published a few years ago <coughs> showed that for, they estimate $4 billion invested in the Human Genome Project. As of 2011, $800 billion in economic return from that investment, from that fund, 200 to 1 return for an investment. Now, that's pretty good. <laughs> it's even better now. Well, by the time we became interested in sequencing genomes, the cost was down to around $25,000 a person. So we could actually imagine doing this with a family. Uh, and I'll just mention that now our cost is under $2,000. You can actually get a whole genome sequence for about $1,000. So an incredible reduction in price in just a decade. Uh, I don't think I've said this to this class, but I think there is no other technology in the history of humanity 
that has seen a million fold reduction in cost in just a decade. For less than the cost of an MRI, we can decode your entire genome. Your MRI results will be different next year, your genome won't. <laughs> so this is another graph, a similar one, published in Nature magazine, a comment scientific publication in 2010, showing that decline in sequencing cost, and with it, an increase in the number of people sequenced. And so I want to blow up the upper right-hand corner here. Uh, as of early 2010, Archbishop Desmond Tutu had been sequenced, the first African to be sequenced. My friend Jim Lupsky, uh, who is at Baylor University, uh, prominent person, prominent member of our genetics community, he has uh, Charcot-Marie tooth disease, a peripheral neuropathy condition, and a family of four. So this is part of that family of four. So, let me give you a little bit of background, about five minutes on next generation sequencing, what we actually did. What we do, we start by chopping the DNA up into small, readable fragments, on the basis, base pairs are shown in size. Usually with most approaches, we make copies, specific copies using PCR, the technique we've talked about, allows you to make many, many copies of any DNA segment. We rapidly sequence the fragments. Now with next-gen sequencing, emphasis on rapid. And there are all kinds of technologies. Don't worry about this, because this is changing all the time. Uh, but a number of techniques that are used to actually do the sequencing. Then we have millions of fragments of DNA, 100, 150 base pairs or so in size. We have to reassemble them into a whole genome sequence. Now the advantage of next-gen sequencing, we always say it's massively parallel. We're repeating millions of fragments at a time. But it's not that accurate. Each read has a relatively high error rate. So we compensate for that by doing many, many reads of every nucleotide base. On average, now typically 40 or 50 times. So this is what comes out of the machine. All of these DNA fragments that have been sequenced uh, from our patient. So our challenge is to knit this back together into a sequence. Well, fortunately, we have the reference sequence, the original DNA sequence uh, that was funded by the NIH. So that's our roadmap. That is a contiguous sequence of the entire human genome. And because of our genetic similarity, remember, we're 99.9% .9 identical, we can line these up with that reference like this. Um, and for every position, we have a series of reads, okay? a series of estimated nucleotides. Uh, so at this position, is this person homozygote or heterozygote? Heterozygote. At least that's our, that's our best guess, because about half of the reads are a C, about half are an A. So half of them may differ from the reference sequence. This could be a disease-causing mutation. So in this case, we just have 11-fold, 11x coverage. Now normally, as I said, we would do 40 or 50, so that we get better accuracy. But our best estimate here is that this would be a heterozygote. Uh, but we would typically have much better coverage. Uh, so that's how we do what we call variant call and genome assembly uh, in a nutshell. Now, we can do whole genomes, as I said, for something on the order of $1,500. Uh, and depending on the quantity and where you go, this cost varies a bit, but it's in that neighborhood. We can sequence the exome, that is all of your exomes, about 1.5% of your DNA, or on the order of $500. So this is becoming very, very affordable technology. Now, the trick, of course, is to find in that 3 billion base pairs of information potentially just one change that causes disease. So we assess the likely functional consequences of each variant. Does it change an amino acid? If so, what is the amino acid change? Is it likely to be severe? We compare it with public databases of known variants. That is, has this variant been seen before? Is it really rare? What does it mean if it's rare? We don't see it in a large population of controls. What's that likely telling us? Yeah, it's most likely to be harmful. If hardly anyone in the general population has it, it's more likely, not 
proven, but more likely to be harmful. And then we assess other patients with the same condition. Do they have mutations in the same gene? So that's basically how we go about analyzing this kind of data. Mr. Peterson. What, um, with the uh, whole genome costing about three times as much, uh, what is the value of doing the entire genome sequence versus just an exome? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, if the question was, um, would this be generally maybe threefold higher in cost than exome? What's the value of doing it? Exome doesn't give us any regulatory sequences, so we don't get promoter, we don't get enhancers. Um, also, exome still doesn't give us all of the exome material. Uh, you use a, what's called a pull-down strategy. It's not 100% effective. Uh, so uh, we often prefer whole genome uh, for that reason. Okay, so we applied this technology uh, to the four members of the Miller Syndrome family, Debbie, Heather, Logan, and their father. Uh, at that time, we used 15 micrograms of DNA from a blood sample. Now we just use one microgram. It's plenty. Uh, we can do this with saliva or blood. We still prefer blood for accuracy. Uh, and we did whole genome sequencing at about a 50x depth in each of our samples. And to make a long story short, because this is a long story, I had a very, very bright postdoc who spent a year of his life analyzing the data, as well as other people from the lab. There's also a group in Seattle. Uh, both exome and whole genome sequencing were done. The exome sequencing revealed this, this gene, DHODH, it's a dehydrogenase that is involved in de novo pyrimidine synthesis. Not really a good candidate for bone malformation syndrome, but every patient with Miller syndrome that has been analyzed has a mutation in this gene. So uh, this is a causal gene for Miller syndrome, a new discovery. And this was a surprise. The exome sequencing also showed that Heather and Logan both have mutations, compound heterozygotes, in a gene called DNAH5. This encodes a dynein heavy chain motor protein that is involved in normal ciliary function. And you know, you know enough about ciliary function in the airway to know if your cilia don't work, you don't clear the airway. Um, so that is the cause of their lung disease. They have primary ciliary dyskinesia. And despite being seen in pulmonary clinic for decades, that was never diagnosed. It was only diagnosed when the sequencing was done. So that explains the bronchiectasis, also explains some misplacement of organs, uh, especially in heaven, because you probably learned in embryology that your cilia need to be properly in order to get left-right orientation of your organs. So that's a frequent feature of ciliary dyskinesia. So going back to the family, now that the sequencing has been done, we know that both children are compound heterozygotes uh, for mutations in DHODH and DNAH5. These are completely independent. They're on two different chromosomes. They're compound heads, so they inherited different kinds of mutations, but they're loss of function uh, in both genes. And they have the F508 deletion, a very, very probable genotype. In fact, I estimated that given the frequency of these conditions, only one in 300 billion people would have this combination. In other words, Heather and Logan have, are almost certainly the only people ever uh, to have this combination of genotypes. So uh, the, the, uh, some of the work, the whole genome sequencing work was published in Science 2010. One of the other things we were able to get from that work, because we were comparing whole genomes of parents and offspring, was the human mutation rate for the very first time. Up until this, up until this we simply didn't know what the mutation rate was in our species. And that's important, because a lot of our work depends on knowing how frequently new variants enter our genome. We were surprised, and of course pleased, to see this work featured on the front page of the New York Times. That's a first for me, probably the last. <laughs> uh, there's also a nice write-up in Nature magazine. And of course, the Salt Lake Tribune uh, picked this up as well. And here's where the story gets a little interesting. Um, Kirsten Stewart, a reporter for the Tribune, uh, did some background research because an article had been published earlier about Logan. And she discovered that Debbie, shown here, uh, has the same last name that one of the authors of the paper did. Me. 
So Kirsten called me up and said, uh, you know, Jordy is kind of an unusual name. Are you two related in some way? And I said, well, um, because of HIPAA and because of our privacy agreements, I really can't tell you anything personal about the family. Well, she turned around and called Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked her the same question. And Debbie said, well, well yeah, he's my husband. <laughs> so. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming <laughs> <laughs> 